What's going on, guys? You doing good? You look good. Hey, turn to your neighbor and say, I prayed all week that I would get to sit beside of you tonight. And God is so good. He just made it happen. Now turn to your other neighbor, the one that you neglected for whatever reason, and let him know that you are happy and excited that they're here too. No, I'm just kidding. Hey, my name is Connor. I'm one of the pastors here at Young Adults. Um, and man, it is an honor for you guys. Um, we're honored that you're here. We're honored that you would take your Thursday, spend your Thursday night um, when you can be out partying, whatever. Uh, hey, I know CCU just had uh, like a freshman uh, like welcome day or move in day. Anybody from CCU in here? Anybody checking it out? No one. Awesome. We have no CCU people here. Cool. We need to change that then. Um, no, but hey, we know that you guys have a lot on your plates, a lot on your schedules. There's a lot of things that you could be doing. But I honestly believe that when we come and make God's presence a priority, he moves in our life. Um, and I know I'm aware that in this room, there's probably people with a lot of different backgrounds, a lot of different walks in faith, a lot of different experiences. And so I'm not here to give you a pep talk or to try to give you like a little rally push. Um, I'm here to talk about Jesus because Jesus is the only person that can change anything in your life, in your heart. I know Jesus radically changed my life. And I just believe that when we come together and we lift up the name of Jesus, um, things can change. And I just feel like there's a lot of us that come into this room tonight like wanting something, right? I don't know if it's your first time here. I'm not going to make you raise your hand, but maybe you haven't been in church in a while and you just came in. Maybe this is like your last hope. And you're like, man, I'm desperate. Can I tell you, it's not Red Rocks. It's not me. It's not going to be the band. It's not going to be a song. But there's this guy that claimed to be God and said that he was going to die and be raised again on the third day, and he did it. And he said that he did it on behalf of you and I, that we could have a healed, whole, mended relationship with God, and that we could be whole people, not just one day in heaven, but right here, right now, through a relationship with him. And so tonight, that's going to be what, that's going to be what tonight's about. It's going to be about Jesus. And so you guys can take your seats. I'm not going to make you stand for the whole thing. If you want to, go for it. But you got to wave a hanky. It's tradition. Um, no, but hey, I'm really excited for tonight. Uh, this is going to be my last night at YA for a couple weeks. <laughs> hey. <laughs> no, I'm going to be MIA for a couple weeks. We have baby number two on the way. Um, coming any minute. We're actually, we're, we're doing a relationship series here coming up soon, and that's how you get babies. Um, that's my... My daughter, Ezra, my beautiful wife, Erin. You guys, shout out to my wife. Isn't it weird when pastors are like, it's my smoking hot, sexy wife? Because what are, what are you, especially as a guy, supposed to say? Like, yeah, she's sexy. It's like, whoa, that's weird. That's uncomfortable. I won't do that to you, but that's my smoking hot, sexy. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, um, the greatest joy I've ever had in my life. Uh, is being a dad, is is getting to build a family with my wife. And uh, it's so cool that um, I'm going to be able to add another little girl to the mix. And uh, her name is going to be, you'll find out on Instagram uh, what her name is going to be. But, uh, but no, we're so excited. And uh, we're having another little girl. And I get asked a lot, hey, do you want to, like, have a boy at some point? Like, don't you want a son? And honestly, before I, ha I started having kids, I was like, yeah, of course. Like, I'm going to have a son. He's going to be a linebacker, like a running back. Like, it's going to be awesome. But can I just be, like, totally transparent? I'm kind of like team girl dad. Like, I love my daughter, and I know I'm going to love the next one. And so I'm just kind of like... I'm excited to be a girl dad. I kind of like low-key hope that if we have more kids that it's a bunch of girls. And so, yeah. And I'm fully prepared, by the way, to go bad boys too at the front door on somebody if they go to try to take my daughter on a date. If you don't know what that means, don't watch it. Um, but it's an incredible movie. I'm not here to talk about my family. Uh, I want to share with you guys something that God has 
been putting on my heart, something that honestly I have been walking out and walking through over the past couple weeks. And so tonight, my message, I hope, is just going to come from a place of sort of overflow of what God has been teaching me and talking to me in my personal life. Uh, if you ask my wife or if you ask the staff, I'm probably one of the most forgetful people you're ever going to meet. I forget a lot. No lie, I have forgotten my aunt and uncle's names before. Um, and I'm not, I'm not kidding. Uh, my, like a lot of my friends that I work with will be like, hey, I really liked what you said in that message. Or do you remember like a couple messages ago you said this? And I truly honestly don't. I, I like don't remember messages that I've given like a month or two ago. Um, and I'm terrible with names. And so I promise you, if we've met, I'll recognize your face, uh, but I won't remember your name. And do not take offense to that. Like I said, I will forget my aunt and uncle's name. I'm just a pretty forgetful person. And it's funny and it's cute and it's annoying when it's with people, but there's often times when I forget a lot of things about God. And I found that recently in my walk with Jesus and following Jesus, I've forgotten a lot of things about who God is. I've forgotten his character. I've forgotten um, who he is, how he feels about me, the thoughts that he thinks about me. And when you forget certain things about God, you can start to have a skewed view of who God is and why you would want to follow him. And so tonight, I want to ask the question, why would I follow Jesus anyway? What would be my motivation to follow Jesus? Why would I follow Jesus? What what would motivate me to do that? And honestly, what are the things that I tend to forget about God as I try to walk out my faith? And so if you have your Bible, we're going to go to Psalm 103. We're going to read just a couple verses. If you don't have a Bible, it'll be up on the screen. But uh, Psalm 103, verses 1 through 5, it says this. It says, Praise the Lord, my soul, and all my inmost being. Praise the Lord. Praise his name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all of his benefits, who forgives all of your sins and heals all of your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles, like I said earlier, the title of my message is this, why would I want to follow Jesus anyway? Let's pray and we're going to dive in. Jesus, thank you so much for being here and being present. God, we don't invite you into this moment because you've been in this moment. You're here in this moment, but you're inviting us to participate in what you want to do in this moment. And so, God, I pray that whatever walls we might have, whatever frustrations, whatever church hurts, whatever baggage, whatever thing we walked into this room with, Holy Spirit, because you're a spirit of peace, would you just lower our walls to hear your word and remind our souls of who you are? Because I honestly believe that when we have the right picture of you, we'll have the right reasons to follow you. And I believe the reasons to follow you are because you're good. So God, we love you so much. It's our honor to come to you tonight and to worship you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen and amen. I got a question that I'm going to throw out to you, and it's going to seem a little ethereal or something, but I I really want you to think about this, all right? Why do you do the things that you do? That's, That's kind of the reaction I was expecting to get, so I'm not surprised. Why do you do the things that you do? Think about it for a minute. All of us do things. Some of us do weird things. Some of us do pretty normal things. But why do you do the things that you do? If you sit back and you think about it for a moment, all of us will discover that we have reasons that we do things that we do in our life. You have a reason for the things, both weird and normal, that you do in your life. For example, Maybe I've been in this weird kick. I don't know why. I used to rock Adidas Moves cologne when I was in middle school, and I hadn't really like found my scent yet, and I guess I'm still on like, a scent journey. If you, if you know me, um, if we're friends, um, you'll know that I've been asking like, a ton of people like Devante. He always smells incredible, so I'm like, what do you wear? Like, which would normally be weird, but I don't know. Well, I'm 33, so I've just stopped caring. Um, <laughs> But, but for maybe some of you, maybe you've bought the same cologne or the same perfume like forever. And maybe it was because one time you wore it and that guy or that girl you were crushing on walked by and was like, oh, wow, you smell pretty good. And you're like, check, I never have to buy another scent <laughs> in my entire life. I found it. I found the one, solid gold, Michael Jordan cologne from Walmart, 25 bucks. I'm rocking it. No lie. I'm not kidding. This is a weird thing that I did. 
my mom would buy me Michael Jordan cologne because he's the goat. And uh, before my rec games in elementary school, I would literally douse myself in Michael Jordan cologne because I just had this thought that, like, maybe I can be like Mike. <laughs> and I would score a lot, and it's just because there'd be, like, a 10-foot radius around me because nobody could breathe. <laughs> but I would just, like, I don't know. It's just, like, a weird thing. That's why I did one of the things that I did. I thought it would make me like Michael Jordan. Speaking of sports, maybe in high school. You played like one of the greatest games of your life. Maybe you played football, basketball, volleyball, whatever, and you just had this game that like marked you, defined your high school career, and you were like, oh my gosh, I need to recreate every moment that like happened leading up to this game. And so you wear like the same underwear, you wear the same socks, hopefully you wash them, but, but like you, you kind of have the same routine, you like lace up your shoes to the same level of tightness. Like there's a reason you're doing the things that you do. No lie, I had this guy who went D1, double-A at my high school. I was a freshman. He was a senior, and he, he, like, played this game that just, like, put him on the map. I think he legit had, like, six or seven sacks in one game against one of the biggest schools in Virginia, and it just put him on the map, and I don't know why, but he had this thought that, like, he wasn't going to wash his practice outfit for the rest of the year. Yeah, for real. That's the noise. Yeah, and it got so bad that our coaches, like, broke into his locker and, like, washed it while he wasn't there. But we, we have these weird things, like these weird reasons for doing the things that we do, right? Or maybe like for all of us, um, Doug kind of talked about this a little bit a couple weeks ago, but we all dressed the same in middle school because we wanted to be cool. Like maybe that one person came in wearing like, a, I don't know, like for me in sixth grade, it was these like Old Navy vests. Um, totally not cool now, obviously, but who knows, maybe they'll come back. But we all like dress the same because we want to be cool, right? Like maybe in middle school for you, it was like popping your collar or God forbid wearing two collared shirts and popping them. I can say with full integrity, I never popped a collar, nigh once did I pop a collar, nor did I wear two polo shirts at one time because I sweat a lot and that just would make me really hot. But, but think about it, for everything you do, for most of the things you do in your life, there is a reason that you do them. And it can be funny and it can be positive or, or, or maybe, you know, you're, you're guarded when you enter into a relationship because the last relationship you got into, uh, they told you that you were the one and they told you that there was nobody other and you found out that there was somebody other and they were kind of cheating on you the entire time and you promised yourself you were never going to be that vulnerable and expose your heart again to somebody else because you were hurt. Or maybe you, you believed in love until your parents got a divorce and it kind of shifted and, and shook your entire framework for what a stable home and, and what marriage means. And so now whenever you get deep into a relationship, you kind of have a tendency to back out and to be nervous because you're not sure what it looks like to be committed forever. We all have these reasons for doing the things that we do. And as I was thinking about this concept this week, I, I thought that, man, this this actually even plays true in our faith. This actually, this, this thought of having reasons for why we do what we do actually plays out in the reason that we believe in God or don't believe in God. It, it plays out in the reasons that we choose to be a follower of Jesus or not to be a follower of Jesus or to take some things Jesus says seriously and other things not so seriously. Like we all have these reasons for doing the things that we do and it, it even plays itself out in our walk of faith. I remember when I was a kid growing up, and I've told this story before, so if you've been coming for a while, you might have heard this, but my church, with all the good intentions in the world, did this play called Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames. Now, some of you in this room are like, I have church baggage. I emailed the pastor and he never responded, and I sent a really well thought out critique of his email or of his message that he gave, and he never returned my email, and I have church baggage, all right? You want to talk about church baggage? I'm about to open my suitcase and show you what church baggage looks like, all right? My church, with all the best intention in the world, would do this outreach where they would get, like, super hype and super pumped, and they would invite, like, everybody. They would, like, hand out these flyers and be like, you got to invite your neighbors to this. you got to invite your fr friends. you got to invite your family, your coworkers, anybody that doesn't follow Jesus. You need to get them to our church because for three nights straight, we are doing a play called Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames. And if, that, if the title just doesn't give you a hint at like what this play is about, 
You know, I, like some of y'all are like, is, are you serious? Like, this is crazy. I'm like, yes, church baggage, you know, for real. And this is how it would work. No lie. No lie. I'm not making this up. On one side of the stage, there would be the gates of heaven, the pearly gates, right? And on the other side of the stage, there would be um, kind of like paper mache being blown up in the air in the wind, like red. You know those like uh, those little like dummy guys that float around at like, it'd be like that, but red because it was supposed to represent fire, you know? Um, and in the middle... There was this giant, like, courtroom judgment seat. And the thought, the idea behind it is we're going to reenact or act out all these different scenarios to where people, I hear somebody laughing, this is... This is 100% true. You can, you can Google this. Some churches are, are brazen enough to put their plays on YouTube. I'm not even kidding. Um, and what would happen is there would be a bunch of different scenarios acted out that would result in some people spending eternity forever with Jesus and some people being dragged in to hell by a guy that looked like Darth Maul <laughs> and a couple characters from Lord of the Rings. And like looking back, I'm like, this is actually something you don't invite your neighbors to. Because this just only like furthers the stereotype of like what church shouldn't be. But, but they would get super hype. And I remember as a little kid, like I would be so scared. And like as a six-year-old, as a seven-year-old, I would be like reflecting on my life. Like the little bit of life that I had lived and the little bit of life that I had had. And, and I would just be like, oh my gosh, like I do not want to get dragged into hell by a guy that looks like that. For real. And there would be all these different scenarios. And then at the very end, the pastor would come up and be like, now who wants to give their life of Jesus, to Jesus? <laughs> Obviously, everybody does because you, and I can say this quite literally, scared the hell out of them. Like, you showed them what it could potentially look like to go to hell. And yes, everybody is just going to make sure they have a fire insurance policy in case something happens on their way home. But I remember as a little kid sitting there and I was just like, oh my gosh, like, is this what God is this what God is like? Like is this is this how God sees me? Is it this easy for God for me to mess up and God to like pull me into this fiery confetti? Like is it like is this God? And this play marked my life both as a child and honestly the the foundation that it laid for my faith still kind of finds its way into echoing into my soul every once in a while. And this play, what it did was it made me afraid of God. It made me feel like God is angry and, and frustrated. And if you make it into heaven, you're lucky just by the, by the skin of your teeth to get in there. It gave me this distorted view of who God is. It made me think that God is this angry person sitting in heaven wanting and waiting for us to mess up because none of us deserve to be with him. And most importantly, because I had a distorted view of who God was, it then gave me a distorted reason for following Jesus. I think so many of us come into this room tonight. And can I be honest, there's this, there's this big wave in the church world right now uh, called deconstruction, where people like to look at their faith and examine their faith or examine their Bible um, and the things that they can't reconcile in their heart and soul, they start to pick apart until eventually they're no longer followers of Jesus. And one, I believe it's because we have a church, we as a church don't have a solid theology on pain and suffering, which the Bible said that Jesus was acquainted with suffering. We don't know why. It's not because God is mean or evil or wants to harm you. It's because we live in a broken, fallen world that there's pain. But the promise and the good news of both Jesus and heaven is that one day, there will be no more pain or suffering. But I honestly think another reason why we see so many young adults in our city walking away from their faith is because they have this distorted view of what it takes to follow after God. And I believe from the bottom of my heart that we create this image of God that isn't really him. But when we have this distorted image of who God is, we then create this distorted reason and these distorted ways we need to follow him. And what happens is like week after week, month after month of trying to appease this angry figure so we don't get thrown into a fiery pit, our souls end up becoming heavy and becoming exhausted. And we sit in our house or we sit watching YouTube videos hoping that the next sermon will give us just enough so that we can carry on our faith for another week when inside we feel like we're suffocating and we're dying. If you have a distorted reason for following Jesus, you're going to feel heavy 
And I remember as a little kid making a decision to follow Jesus one day at one of these plays. I did it every year. (laughs) But I remember I wanted to follow Jesus not because I loved him, not because I thought he loved me, not because I thought he was good or not because he promised me joy or forgiveness. I wanted to follow Jesus because I was afraid and I was ashamed and I was made aware of the things that I did and I was made aware of the things and the reasons why I didn't deserve God's love. And so not because we serve a loving and accepting God that I want to follow him. I, I was afraid and I was ashamed of him. And it created this unhealthy cycle in my life of performing for God and making him proud and then messing up and making him frustrated. And we actually see this cycle sort of playing out in the New Testament. There's this group of people called the Pharisees that Jesus is constantly having an engagement with. Now, the Pharisees in and of themselves aren't bad people. I think a lot of times we give them this bad rep. We give them this bad reputation that they were evil and that they hated God and that they wanted to just frustrate Jesus and whatever he did. But the Pharisees were actually a very serious religious group. Their number one goal in life, their number one desire was to be holy and to make the communities that they lived in holy as well. And it's estimated, they believed that there was a limited amount of people that were allowed to be Pharisees. And around Jesus' day and age, there was about 6,000 of them. And they took the Torah, the law, not just the Ten Commandments, but the first five books of the Bible extremely seriously. And we see Jesus kind of engaging with them all the time about arguing. They're like, hey, what's the greatest law? Or what do you believe about this? Or what happens in this scenario? We see Jesus engaging with the Pharisees all the time about the Old Testament and kind of a narrative that has circulated its way around churches that when when we see Jesus engaging with these conversations, he's kind of trying to dismiss or discredit the power of the Old Testament. But that's actually not true. If you think about it, the Old Testament was the only Bible that Jesus had at the time. The New Testament hadn't been written yet because Jesus hadn't died and rose again. But we see Jesus engaging with these people, and what he's engaging with actually is not the law of God. He's actually not challenging them necessarily on the Ten Commandments or the Torah. He's challenging them on the way that they interpret it because the the Pharisees had this appearance of holiness and righteousness, but they had actually missed the heart of God and their desire to serve him and to follow him. And the Pharisees, they were so obsessed with being holy and making their uh, communities holy that they actually did this thing called fencing in the law. Now, I don't know if you ever heard of this. I'm a little bit of a Bible nerd, paid like $10,000 to go to Bible school. It serves me great. Um, I'm kidding. That was a student debt joke. Um, maybe some of you are like, now I'm reflecting on my student debt. Oh, my gosh. But they did this thing called fencing the law, and it actually came from a verse in Deuteronomy 22.8 that said if you build a home that has a roof, and a lot of times in Jewish culture they would do a lot of like dinners and activities on their roof, so Jewish culture was balling out. They had like rooftop patios downtown. But it says that if you have a rooftop patio, basically you need to build a fence around it because if you have a party, if you have people over and somebody falls off and gets hurt or, God forbid, dies, their blood is going to be on your hands. Now, that seems like a practical law, but the way they interpreted that was, okay, if we need to put a fence around our roof, we need to put a fence around God's law. We we don't even want to come close to breaking one of God's laws. And so what we're going to do is we're going to create these uh, these oral traditions, these these methods, these these other laws that will surround God's law so that if you break a law, you're going to have to break one, two, three, four, five, six other laws just to get to God's law. And when Jesus challenges them on their interpretation of the Old Testament, it's not necessarily that he's saying the Old Testament, you don't understand it, it's not right. What he's saying is you have made this so hard to follow God because you've taken the law that God has given you as a gift and you've built so many parameters around it and you're so worried about performing and acting and behaving for God that you've missed the heart of God giving you the law in the first place. See, the Pharisees in the Old Testament believed that God gave them the law to make them righteous. But God didn't give them the law to make them righteous. He gave them the law to create a relationship with them. You say, well, how do you know that? It's the law. The law was never given for a human being to be able to fulfill the law. I don't know if you've ever written, or you've ever uh, written, I hope not. I, hope, I don't know if you've ever read the Old Testament. 
But I remember one time last year we were reading through the Bible um, with our intern class, and I just remember getting to the place where it's just law after law after law, and there's 613 laws in the Old Testament. And I just remember thinking literally like, there is no way God realistically expected these people to be able to keep this law. And that's the entire point. God has zero expectation that a person is going to be able to keep every single law that would set them apart and make them holy, just like God. So these Pharisees were so obsessed with being holy that they created more laws on top of more laws, and they missed the point, they missed the heart of God giving them the law in the first place. It was not to make them righteous, but it was to point them to the one who would one day make them righteous. It was to show them that the law is not given for you to fulfill, but to actually expose your inability to keep it and to show your soul's need for somebody who actually can, a perfect sacrifice. And these Pharisees that Jesus would battle with and engage with were so obsessed with keeping the letter of the law that they forgot the heart of God in the first place. They forgot the reason why the law was given to them initially. And they forgot the reason for following God in the first place. They forgot that God's good. They forgot that he's kind. And they forgot that you don't earn salvation by working or behaving or performing, but it's actually God's kindness and his goodness that leads you to repentance. They forgot that God doesn't want your performance. He's after your heart. And if you give God your heart, your behavior, will start to line up eventually. You'll never be perfect this side of eternity. But when you allow God to have your heart and not just your behavior, you're going to see things change in your life. And I was reading all these stories of Jesus engaging with the Pharisees. And, and, and you know, a lot of times when we read the Bible, we like to, like, make ourselves the heroes, right? Like, when we read the story of the four guys dropping their friend through the roof, you're like, I'm going to be that. I'm going to be one of those guys. And I think we should. I think we should invite people. I think we should find broken, hurting, needing people and bring them into this room, not to hear me preach or to hear worship, but to d encounter the presence of God that could change their life. But I think a lot of times when we read the Bible, we like to make ourselves the heroes. And I like to read and be like, man, I would be just like Peter and I would like walk out on the water too, right? Man, I, 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 would, I would be just like Jesus, and I would defend that woman who was caught in adultery and draw something in the sand. You know, probably like, screw you Pharisees, you don't even understand anything. A holy middle finger, if that's like even a thing, like, get out of here. But as I'm reading all these encounters with Jesus and the Pharisees, I, I had this moment where God in like opened my eyes to see, like, man, how often do I relate to being a Pharisee? Man, as I read these stories and engaged in these stories, how often do I find myself fighting with God, wrestling with God, saying like, man, didn't I like do good enough this week? Are you happy with me? Not only did I not look at anything bad, I like deleted the app. Not only did I like not gossip about somebody, I made sure that I didn't even like leave the door for that. God, I fenced myself in in such a way that I performed so well for you. Aren't you happy with me now? And Jesus is like, no, 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 you're missing the point. And I'm like, no, God, you're missing the point. Because I did it. I'm doing it. I'm reading your word. I'm performing. Shouldn't I get something in return? Shouldn't I make you happy? Isn't this what following Jesus is all about, right? How often do I find myself as I read the Bible, actually not the hero, but sitting in the place of the Pharisees? And I started to wonder, Man, how often do I forget why I started to follow Jesus in the first place? How many times throughout my day, my week, my year, do I forget why I followed Jesus in the first place? I was recently uh, taking a walk. Every, every morning I walk my dog. He's a golden retriever. He's an utter spaz. Um, he literally attacked another dog this morning. What golden retriever attacks another dog? I don't know. Mine does. But around 6 o'clock every morning, I wake up and I go out to this little back trail um, and I walk him. And that's normally when I have some tough conversations with Jesus. And I was just like, God, can I be honest, man? I feel so dry right now in my spirit. I feel like young adults has become a job. I feel like going to church on Sundays has just become part of the routine. I feel like when I read my Bible, I'm trying to like earn favor from you. 
And then if I just read four chapters instead of three or five instead of four, that maybe that'll be the thing that makes me feel your pleasure and makes me feel your, your, your happiness with me or your joy. Like, but God, if I'm just being honest, I'm frustrated, I'm tired, I'm exhausted. I feel like the, the weight of following Jesus is getting too heavy. And if I'm being completely honest, I don't even know some days why I follow Jesus anyway. I don't know why I do it. And I remember I was walking my dog and I was having this moment and sometimes God speaks to me directly, other times it takes a while, but um, I remember just specifically feeling like God placed in my heart. He said, oh, it's okay that you feel that way, but can I tell you why you feel that way? And I was like, yeah, God, what's going on? And he's like, you've forgotten about me. And I was like, God, what do you mean? I haven't forgotten about you. I work for you. I literally work for a church. I pray. I like read my Bible. Like I have not forgotten about you. He's like, no, no, no. You haven't forgotten that I exist. You just forgot who I am. You've forgotten my characteristics. You've forgotten my core. You've forgotten who I have shown you that I am. And you've actually forgotten, Connor, that I have benefits. I'm like, what? What do you mean benefits? Like, and no lie, I, like, th- this doesn't happen often, but I felt like God was like, get, up, get out your phone, go on your Bible app, and look up Psalm 103. And so I did. I pulled out my phone, and one of the first things that comes up is it says, praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not his benefits. There are some of you that have been following Jesus in this room almost your entire life. And you're at a point, maybe you're in college or maybe you're in your job and you feel this tension in your soul because you're fighting and you're struggling and and you want to be faithful to God and you want to make him proud and you want to make him happy. But if you're being honest, you come into this room every single week and you're not even sure why you follow Jesus. Can I tell you that it's okay to follow God because of his benefits? It's actually why we want to follow Jesus. We follow God because Jesus has benefits. And I want you sitting in your chair right now to ask your soul deeply, have I forgotten Jesus' benefits? Have I forgotten the benefits of God? And I honestly was almost nervous to like to say like, hey, this is a reason why we should follow Jesus because on the surface level, it almost sounds self-serving, right? Right? Well, I don't follow Jesus because of his benefits. I follow Jesus because he died for me. Benefit, just to let you know. Well, I don't follow Jesus because he can do something for me. I follow Jesus because he makes me holy. Benefit, you know what I mean? And I remember walking my dog and just thinking like, God, why did I feel like I can literally do or give you anything? Why do I put myself in this position to think that you are just waiting for Connor to perform and you give me a round of applause? God, when has my life, when has my joy, when has my peace not always hinged on your benefits? God, forgive me for how quickly I can sometimes forget your benefits. Psalm 103, 1 through 17, King David is sitting in his throne, he's sitting in his kingdom. A lot of scholars believe he's writing this at the end of his day, reflecting near the end of his life, and honestly reflecting on the things that got him through following Jesus his entire life, the highs and the lows. And I think it's so interesting that a man that was called after God's own heart, who we clearly see have failures and frustrations, high moments and low moments, sitting near the end of his life reflecting, and he's like, what got me through? Why did I follow Jesus anyway? And he pins down Psalm 103 and he says, Praise the Lord, O my soul. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul. And forget not his benefits. There are some of you that have come in this room tonight ready to do the same religious song and dance. God, I'm going to come, I'm going to say I'm sorry, I'm going to lift my hands, and I'm going to walk out and I'm going to try to be better than I was last week. Can I tell you, just freaking scrap that playbook and latch on to the benefits of God. Have we forgotten that God is good? Have we forgotten that God is better? 
I feel like we have a generation of people saying, why would I want to follow Jesus anyway? Because Jesus has benefits. Psalm 103 tells us, it says this, it says, he forgives all of your sin. Anything you have ever done wrong, past, present, future, benefit of God, he forgives it. Doesn't remember it, doesn't think about it. He forgives all your sin. Psalm 103, David is saying he heals all of your disease. I'm talking physical illness. I'm talking mental illness. I'm talking anything that would inhabit you from encountering the God who is called peace. A benefit of God is that he heals all of your disease. It says he redeems your life from the pit. That means when you go off and do stupid things, he's not sitting around waiting for you like, man, told you, knew you would come back. He's the one that actually grabs you out of that situation and redeems you. It is a benefit of God. Jesus has benefits. If you follow Jesus, there are benefits. It says he crowns you with love and compassion. When the times where you walk in here and you've just walked away from a one night stand the night before, maybe you've been in a relationship and you were honoring God in that and you feel like your head has been crowned with shame and you feel like your head has been crowned with disqualification for following Jesus. He says, nope, that's not the crown I told you to wear. I crown you with love. I crown you with compassion. That is a benefit of following Jesus. David says he satisfies your desires with good things. So many of us come into this room with so many different desires and God doesn't steal from you. God never robs you. Not, God never withholds from you. God satisfies your desires with good things. It is a benefit of following Jesus is that God meets your needs with good, with good things. It says he renews your youth. It doesn't mean you're going to look like Jennifer Aniston and friends forever. What he's saying is that you can have a youthful spirit. You can look towards the future with anticipation of good things. You can believe that the best is yet to come in your life. God renews your youth that is a benefit of Jesus. When you feel oppressed, you can know that he is working righteousness and justice on your behalf. You don't have to fight your battles. You don't have to fight to justify yourself. You don't have to try to reach and earn anything. When somebody offends you, when somebody oppresses you, God is already fighting for you. It is a benefit of following Jesus. He says that he is compassionate and he is gracious. There are so many of you that walk into this room feeling ugly, feeling dirty, feeling ashamed. That is not how God sees you. When you follow Jesus, he is compassionate towards you. He is gracious towards you. It is a benefit of following God. He is slow to anger. God is slow to anger. He is not like your father. He is not like your mother. He is not like somebody that continually reminds you of all the times you mess up. God is slow to anger. He is kind to you. It is a benefit of following Jesus. He is abounding in love. He does not treat us as our sins deserve. You do not walk in here and God treats you like the ex-pornographer or the ex-adulterer or the ex-liar or the ex-drug dealer. He does not treat you as your sins deserve. Jesus treats you like a son of God, like a daughter of God, like a child of a king. It is a benefit of following Jesus. He does not repay us according to our wrongdoing, but according to what Jesus has done. The Bible says, as high as the heavens are from the earth, so great is God's love for you. Literally, I am a dad and I cannot fathom a love deeper than what I have for my wife and my children. But the Bible says that God's love for you is deeper. It is higher. It is further. God God loves you with an inexpressible passion that says that he has removed your transgression and sin as far as the east is from the west. Listen, you do not walk in here marked by what you have done in your past. The Bible actually says that Jesus has a selective memory. You say, how can God forget something? Because he chooses to. He's God. The Bible says that when you walk into this room, God does not see you as uh, an ex-sinner who, who is coming to beg and plead for forgiveness. It, the Bible actually says that when you walk in here, he says, oh, that's my son, that's my daughter, I see Jesus. And the enemy wants to accuse you and, and, and remind you, oh, no, 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 God sees you as the person you slept with the other week. God sees, God, don't you remember that person they slept with? No, I forgot. God, how can you forget? I'm God, their sin is as far as the east is from the west. I remember their sins and their transgressions no more. I only see them through the light and the life of Jesus Christ. 
He removes your sin. Listen, why follow Jesus? Because he's good. It is a benefit of God. It says that God has compassion on you the way a good parent has compassion on their children. I don't know if anybody in here had a bad parent. God is not a bad parent. God is a good parent. You are God's child that he loves. It says from everlasting to everlasting, meaning forever God's love is with you. And I love this. And I don't know if it's just because I'm about to have a kid or whatever. And it's not just for you. God's love, God's favor, God's peace. It's not just for you. It says his righteousness will be with your children and their children and their children. Why follow Jesus anyway? Because he's good. And he thinks good things towards you. And he loves you. And he has benefits for your life. Man, how many of us walk into this room night after night with this distorted view of God and these distorted reasons for following Him? I would love if this is a place where we reframe God and the first thing people think about when they think of Jesus is good. Oh yeah, Jesus, I know He can be a little controversial, but He's good. Jesus, oh yeah, I, I know I can walk through some hard seasons sometimes, but He's got blessing coming my way. He's got favor coming my way. Jesus has good things in store for me. Yeah, that thing that I did that I messed up and, and it haunts me a little bit. You know, it's crazy. God doesn't even remember it. I don't have to pay penance to God because Jesus paid penance on my behalf. You know, it's God is good. And we live in a world that is questioning now more than ever, why follow Jesus? And there are a million reasons. That's just Psalm 103. There are millions and millions of reasons to follow Jesus. But I think at the core, can we just agree that it's because he's good? You want to follow Jesus. There are people in this room right now, I, I just feel it in my spirit, that you are so afraid to let go of something because you think God is trying to steal from you or rob from you. You think God is trying to steal something, but God is so good. Man, if you reframe your thoughts towards Jesus, you'll reframe your reason for following him. So would you all stand with me? I believe in this room tonight, you're here because your soul is tired. Maybe your soul is tired. Maybe you're feeling burnout and you walked in here and you're like, this is my last shot at following God. The weight of being a Christian is too heavy. The weight of following Jesus is too much. And if I'm being totally honest, I feel like I'm failing. If that's you, would you raise your hand? If you came in here tonight feeling heavy, feeling overwhelmed, feeling like you're just not doing it, good enough. Would you lift your hand and would you begin to remind your soul of the goodness and the faithfulness of Jesus? There's this phrase in my mind that I just can't shake and I believe that I've been listening to this song all day and all week and I just felt like God was singing this over me as I was on my walk with my dog and he was just saying, I'm for you. I'm for you. No, you don't understand. I'm for you. Yeah, God, but what about the times I'm not for you? That's okay, I'm for you. I'm for you. Some of you in this room need to remind your soul, God is for me. God is for me. His favor is for me. His blessings are for me. God is for me. And maybe tonight we've forgotten that the reason we follow Jesus isn't because we have to pay him back. It's because he's good. God loves you. He is faithful. And God is for you. Can we pray tonight? Jesus, we love you so much. God, in the moments where we feel tired and we feel weak, God, in the moments where our performance has let us down again and again, would you remind us that it's not about us performing for you. It's about what you've done for us. And God, in the moments, even when we can't believe, would you remind our soul, you are for me. God, you are for me. Jesus, you are for me. Your love and your grace doesn't pass over me. It is for me. God, your forgiveness is for me. You are for me and you are good. And I pray that as we go into a moment of worship, could we echo what King David said, reflecting on his life. Praise the Lord, my soul. Bless his holy name. Praise the Lord my soul and forget not his benefits. Why follow Jesus? Because he's good. God is good. And he loves you. 
Jesus, we love you so much. It's in your mighty and holy and good name we pray. And everybody in this room said amen. And amen. Let's worship Jesus today.